Well, good morning, church, and we are glad you asked. Uh, my name's Ethan, I'm one of the ministers here, and uh, we're kicking off a brand new series, and I tell you, we have had so much fun uh, prepping these series. This whole series is based off questions that you all submitted back in January when we did round one of this, and they have been great questions, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and we're gonna take more, so actually, you can submit questions again now. If you've got a question, uh, you want to hear somebody talk about, um, you can write it on your connection card, which Megan just mentioned, or uh, you can email Laurel Guy. She'll be collecting questions because we're going to do this series again in several months. And so we need another round of questions. And we've already got a lot. Um, we can't answer all of the questions that we got submitted. It was dozens and dozens and dozens of questions. Uh, but a few clusters emerged, kind of questions on the same theme. And so we we thought that was a good indication of where we should spend our time uh, this month. And none of the questions that you all submitted uh, were easy. Uh, it would have been nice if we'd gotten some easy questions, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? That's 67. We figured that out 1,200 years ago, so we know that number. Um, or, or what about this question? Can God make a rock so heavy that God can't lift it? Uh, we know the answer to that one. Obviously, yes, God can make a rock. God can make anything. And then, yes, God can lift it because God is all powerful. So you figure that out, but that's the answer. Um, but we didn't get any questions like that. We got hard questions. Uh, one of the clusters of questions that we're going to talk about today uh, were questions about Christian disagreement. The what, why, how, what causes it, and what do we do about Christian disagreement. Because apparently, Christians don't always agree. I've done some research, and it turns out the questioners are right. Even Christians who agree on Jesus, agree that the Bible is God's word, and it's our only reliable authority for faith and practice, still find other things to disagree about. I know some of you will find that hard to believe. You've never met a Christian who disagrees with you about anything, but apparently it happens. And it isn't new, and it's sometimes very hard. And enough of you asked about it that we thought we better tackle it. We see disagreement among God's people even in Scripture. You've got examples from the Old Testament where two prophets would stand in the presence of the king and prophesy different things and each call each other a liar. And the king would have to be like, okay, I guess we'll wait and see which one of you's right and we'll kill the other one or something like that. But, you know, we have that. Um, one of, in my mind, the most tragic painful disagreement in all of Scripture uh, is the disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas had worked together. They'd planted churches together. They had served together. They had ministered together. They had done so much good work together. In fact, they had just gotten back from a big conference in order to settle some disagreements, a great compromise conference for how they were going to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. And then in Acts 15, verse 36, we see this, this, this tragic little story, just a few verses long. Sometime later, that is after this conference, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas liked this idea, no disagreement so far. But then in verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. I hate this little story. Paul and Barnabas, had, they didn't been in prison together. They had been persecuted together. They'd fled the mob together. They'd planted churches together. And can you just imagine? Like this is, I don't know, just one sentence. They had a sharp, but this is a multi-day disagreement, right? 
Like there's day one where Paul's like, dude, you ready to go? And Barnabas is like, I am totally ready to go. I'm thinking we should give Mark a second chance. And Paul's like, what? You want to give Mark? He's like, yeah, yeah, they call me the son of encouragement. I think dude needs another second, second chance. We gave you a second chance, Paul. Remember that? And Paul's like, no, man, you leave me in Pamphylia once. That is one too many times. Nobody leaves me in Pamphylia. And then they go to their separate ways. And the next day, you know, maybe they're talking. Like, really? You want to bring Mark? Really? You won't give Mark a second chance? Maybe it was day three that one of them said, dude, I don't think we can travel together this trip. Maybe I'll go to Cyprus and check on them and you go to Syria and check on them? Maybe. And they part ways. These kinds of strategic disagreements still happen, don't they, right? You love somebody, you, you, love G, you both love Jesus, you've got a same mission, but you've got a, a strategy difference. I did ministry for a while with a guy. Man, we loved each other, we respected each other, we worked well together. And we agreed on almost everything. Like, he'd given us a Bible quiz, we would have checked all the same boxes. But there were some strategic uh, approaches that we each were really passionate about that just didn't align. And, and eventually we agreed that, you know, it's, this isn't a big deal. We still love each other and we still think each other's, but we think we could work better together if we work separately. I still see him at conferences every once in a while, but it kind of makes me sad. I liked working with him, but we had kind of different strategies. But that kind of disagreement although it still happens, that actually wasn't what your questions are about. Your questions were about the kind of disagreement that arises when we read, understand, apply, and interpret the Bible differently. We read the Bible, and, but, and, we're, and we're doing it together, but we understand it differently, and we interpret it differently, and we apply it differently, and it just leads to different conclusions. Here are some examples of the kind of questions we got. Somebody wrote this. Everything in the Bible is said to be true. But does that mean that each word and phrase that we use when studying the Bible can't be interpreted differently by different people? Even different versions of the Bible sometimes use different words in the same passage. Somebody else asked this. What do we do about the fact that Christians disagree about how to interpret the Bible? sometimes even on important issues. Somebody wrote in, and for them it was personal. They wrote this. If I disagree strongly with someone in the church about what the Bible says, how do we settle it? I like that question. You know, they're not asking, you know, does it happen? They know it happens. And they're trying to figure out how do we settle Christian disagreement? This is real stuff. It's common stuff. And, and if you've lived any length of time in the church, you know, you don't need me to do the research. You've done the research. The research is your life. You've had this happen. People who love Jesus and they love God's word and they're submitted to it, they just disagree with you about what it means. And this kind of interpretive disagreement and application disagreement, it can arise for lots of reasons. And sure, I know sometimes it arises for bad reasons, right? Like sometimes the reason is it's sin, right? Like I don't want to admit what I know the Bible plainly says because if I admitted what the Bible plainly says, then I would have to change the way I live and I don't want to change the way I live. So I'll just pretend like the Bible is fine with greed because I'm fine with greed. And so let's pretend the Bible is too, right? I know that sometimes in interpretive disagreements arise uh, from that. Or maybe it arises because of lack of study. You know, we haven't actually invested in studying the text and learning what God's Word says and having the conversations we need to come to a common mind. Okay, sometimes that's why it happens too. But not always. Sometimes disagreement just arises because we've hit a passage or a, a, a question that's hard to figure out. Maybe the language is complicated. The Bible is written in a different language. Sometimes translation is, is legitimately difficult. 
Maybe we have a question about audience. We wonder how much of what was said to them was universal, it applies to all of us, and how much just applies to, to them. Or maybe we look at the whole breadth of Scripture and we find some verses that seem to point in one direction and some verses that seem to point in another and we, we can't quite figure out how to reconcile the totality of the text. And, and one person reconciles it one way and one person reconciles it another. See, sometimes Christian disagreement arises just out of the nature of understanding God's Word, not because anybody's doing anything wrong. Now, there have been people uh, throughout church history who have wanted to try to avoid all Christian disagreement. Uh, one standard approach to this is you have a rigid church leadership that decides this is what we believe, we all believe this, we all think the same way, and if anybody believes different, they're not one of us, we don't even think they're a Christian. Quickly, we remove anyone who dares to disagree. Another approach to, to try to work on Christian agreement and eliminate Christian disagreement is the church shopping approach, right? That's where the individual, at the first sign of any disagreement with anybody, they just pack up and leave. And they go find a different church, and they've got their list of all the things. Do we agree on this, and or this, and this, and this, and this? And if we agree on everything, then I'll stay until I find the thing we disagree on, and then I add that to my list, and I leave and go find the next church. And my list just gets longer and longer, hoping I can find a church. The problem with both of these strategies is they both always fail. You can study church history, they are never successful. Those who attempt the rigid authoritarian approach where we demand that everybody agree with what the leaders have decided we're all supposed to agree with and anybody who disagrees isn't even a Christian, that doesn't actually create agreement. It just creates liars. We all hide and pretend we agree because we're so afraid of the consequences of admitting that we disagree or that we're confused. And the church shopping approach doesn't work either. It just makes us increasingly picky because every time you find a disagreement, you add that to your list of the things we have to disagree on, and soon your list gets pettier and pettier and pettier, and you can't go to any church. I was talking to a fellow one time. We had gone to church together some 20 years prior, ran into each other. He'd moved to a big city. I said, so have you found a church? And he said, no. There's not a right-thinking church in that whole town. I was like, yeah, I don't know, bud. I'm not sure the problem is all those churches. Just going out on a limb here, I'm not sure the problem is every church in that town of 600,000 people is apostate. I'm just guessing. I think there might be a different problem. So both these strategies fail, but that actually isn't the worst thing with these two strategies, the authoritarian strategy or the church shopping strategy. The worst thing is they aren't what the Bible teaches. That isn't what the Bible teaches about how to approach Christian disagreement. And there are lots of places where the Bible talks about this. The, almost the whole book of Philippians is about Christians disagreeing and how do we live together even when we disagree. Uh, the Bible talks about this in the book of Acts, in Galatians, in 1 John. Uh, but today, we're just going to spend a big chunk of time in two chapters of the book of Romans. Because a big chunk of the book of Romans is Paul addressing uh, issues very similar to the questions you all asked. What do we do when Christians disagree about their understanding, interpretation, and application of Scripture? How do we handle it? Uh, in this case, uh, the things they're disagreeing about, just to be clear, these are not salvation issues. They aren't, they aren't disagreeing about Jesus. That's not what I'm talking about today when we disagree about who Jesus is or how he saves us. But they are disagreeing in, in, in the Roman situation about very important issues, issues that had moral implications, that had interpretive implications, and ultimately had relational implications that legitimately threatened to divide their church in half. And let's hear how Paul tackles what do we do? when Christians disagree. I'm going to be in Romans chapter 14, and I'm really going to read a ton of text. So I hope if you've got your Bibles, it's worth turning to it. We're just going to stay in Romans 14 for a while. If you've got a phone with you, open it up, Google Romans 14. You'll want to be able to reference this text because uh, really the whole argument is Paul's, not mine. All right, Romans 14 verse 1. 
Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. All right, let's pause here and make sure we understand what it is they disagree about. They got two things they disagree about. First is the question, can we eat the meat? And then in verse five, we're gonna discover the other disagreement they have is, what do we do about the sacred days? Can we eat the meat? And are some days more sacred than another? Now, just so we know, the meat issue at stake here is not about health or vegetarianism or, you know, food processing, anything like that. Uh, The issue actually at stake is idol worship. In the ancient world, uh, when a typical butcher would uh, kill an animal and prepare the meat for sale, Uh, they would offer a little sacrifice and a prayer to the God of their choice as they killed the animal. So basically, all the meat you could purchase in the market was somehow tainted with the idol worship of the pagan world. And so some Christians think, if I buy this meat, I'm contributing to false gods and paganism. And some of the Christians think, oh, for crying out loud, just buy the meat. It's, they're going to, you're not, this is, you're not, this is not your problem. You don't have to worry about this. The sacred day issue, which comes up in verse five, uh, is about the, the commands of the Old Testament uh, to celebrate specific holidays and in particular to keep the Sabbath day. Uh, and again, some Christians thought uh, these are commanded of God's people. Now we should keep, continue to keep these days. Uh, and some Christians are like, no, that law no longer applies to us. We don't have to do this. But what's important to know is the issues they disagree about are about obedience to biblical law. And the laws in question include the Ten Commandments. These are really vital, important moral issues. I know they seem outdated to us, but not to them. Some thought these laws were still fully in effect and that both Jews and Gentiles who wanted to be part of God's people should follow them. Others thought that the fulfilling work of Christ meant that these laws no longer applied, even to faithful Christians. So Paul jumps in, and he jumps in, really, almost his whole argument is in these next two verses, verses three and four. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. That's where he starts. No matter where you are on either side of this interpretive disagreement, you can't judge the person you disagree with. Why? Because God accepted them. Who are you to reject them? He goes on and asks that very question. Who are you to judge somebody else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. This might be one of my favorite paragraphs in the whole Bible. Uh, this word for servant here is the word for a household servant, someone who worked intimately with their master. Uh, maybe like, think like a butler or a maid who was there in the home directly serving the master. And he's like, how weird it is to judge somebody else's servant. They don't answer to you. The only opinion they have to worry about is the opinion of their master. That's who judges the servant. He says it's before their master that they will stand or fall. But good news, they will stand. Again, why will they stand? Not because they're going to get the answer to the question right. Not because they've got everything figured out. Not because they've always interpreted the Bible correctly. They will stand because Jesus is able to make them stand. I was reading, I I got, spent a little too much time with Romans this week. I just got having fun and reading commentaries. And I got reading one commentary uh, by James Dunn, who writes in response to this paragraph, he says, this reveals what Paul consistently teaches, that the standard of judgment 
is no longer your adherence to the law or even your understanding of the law. The standard now is your trust in Jesus, for he is the only one who can judge, and he is the one who will make us stand. That's what Paul says. All right, he goes on. Now we're going to bring up this other issue. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. Whoever abstains does so to the Lord, and they give thanks to God. None of us live to ourselves alone. None of us dies to ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be Lord of both the dead and and the living. I love this perspective. What this means is that even when we disagree on the demands of God's word, if we are genuinely attempting to live obedient to God, then even when we do different things, both of them give God's glory. You see, sometimes we see the reality of Christian disagreement and we get some fear. What if I get it wrong? I've got to get this settled. This person thinks this, and this person thinks this, and how do I pick between them? And what if I'm wrong? If I'm wrong, God will be pretty mad at me, and I'll be in trouble. And Paul says, no, not not at all. If you're wrong, but you're living in submission to Jesus, then you're giving thanks to God. All right, so already we've got two reasons not to judge. First reason we can't judge one another over Christian disagreement is because Jesus is the judge and only our master is authorized to judge us. The second reason we can't judge is because if a person is faithfully trying to obey Jesus, God is glorified by their effort to obey, even if they're in error on this issue. The third reason Paul's going to tell us we can't judge is because there is a judgment coming. And who are we to jump the gun? Look what he says next. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand at the judgment seat. It's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. There will be a judgment, Paul says. The servants will be judged by their master. And they will stand, but not because they got it all right, not because they were perfect servants, not because they always understood all the master's commands, and not because those commands they understood, they always executed perfectly. They will stand because their master is able to make them stand. Those who are servants of Christ will stand because the Lord is able to make them stand, and those who are not will not because no one can stand under their own strength. But if there is a judgment coming, we don't need to go borrow a pair of judges' robes like we're the little judges and and take that role upon ourselves now. He goes on. Therefore, let's just stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, you make up your mind to never put a stumbling block or an obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. For instance, now, by the way, he's about to settle the problem. Okay, we came here with Christian disagreement. Paul's going to tell us all what we're supposed to think. He says, for instance, I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord, that nothing is unclean in itself. This is what's so fascinating about this example of Christian disagreement and how Paul approaches it. Paul actually is convinced he knows the answer. This could have been a two-sentence part of his letter. Hey, by the way, I hear you're arguing over whether you can eat meat or not. You can totally eat meat. Done. Next question. Like Paul could have just settled this. He could have just issued a ruling. But he doesn't. He waits 14 verses before he even gives his clear opinion. And then he immediately says this. I'm convinced you can eat whatever you want. But if someone else regards something as unclean, then for that person, it's unclean. If you think God is telling you don't eat meat, well, you better not eat meat. 
Because obedience to God matters a lot more than agreement with the Apostle Paul. And if that was true for Paul, it's probably true for you and me too, huh? That obedience to God matters a lot more than agreeing with me or me agreeing with you. Paul reveals the answer. Don't think for a second that the only reason Paul is advocating tolerance of disagreement is because Paul is like, well, this is a stumper. No one will ever know whether we can eat meat or not. No, Paul absolutely knows. He's super sure. But something else matters more. He goes on. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. So let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Man, just think of that. Okay, what do I do about the fact that Christians sometimes disagree? Well, already Paul says, well, you can't judge each other because the only one fit to judge you is your master, Jesus, and he will make sure you stand. And then he says, but in your life together, do every, make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God. What is the work of God? The, the human, the individual that Christ has redeemed. Don't destroy another person just to prove how right you are on this food issue. All food is clean, sure. Like again, he's clear, cards on the table. Eat whatever you want. Absolutely, you have that freedom in Christ. But it's wrong for the person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, you keep that between yourself and God. Now, in English, this phrase, keep that between yourself and God, it could sound like he means don't talk about it. Just keep that to yourself. That isn't what he means in this case. What he means by keep it between what you believe about these things is your moral obligation to God. Don't impose it on someone else. Now, are we going to talk about our interpretive disagreements? Obviously, we're going to talk about it. Paul is in the middle of talking about it right now. It's not that Paul is saying you can't say, hey, I know you read that text that way and you think it means this, but I'm pretty sure it means this. Have you con it's not that we can't talk about our disagreements or even try to persuade other people but to impose on someone, to tempt someone, to break their conscience just to do what you agree with is to tempt them into rebellion. Listen to what he says next. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So Paul is introducing here a really important moral concept uh, that I, I kind of like to call Paul's theory of error and rebellion. Error and rebellion. He's imagining a person who said, who's convinced, man, we shouldn't eat that meat. I know you say we should, but I'm just sure that meat has been infected by idol worship. And if I buy that meat and eat that meat, I'm contributing to paganism. I shouldn't eat that meat. He's imagining that person. And they go to a church potluck and they're sitting next to one of the bacon eaters. And one of the bacon says, dude, you got to try this. Oh, come on. Forget all that stuff. You're such an old fuddy-duddy. Just eat the meat, man. Just eat the meat. And they're like, oh, okay, whatever. And they eat it. Now, according to Paul, that person is not in error. Paul's very clear. He thinks they can eat all the meat they want. So they've done nothing wrong. They are not in error. But they are in rebellion because they have done what they think God commanded them not to do. And Paul says that is the grievous sin. Rebellion against what you believe the call of God is, that is the great threat. To err 
with a posture of trust and obedience to God, well, that's just to be wrong. And Paul's like, dude, y'all people wrong all the time. Relax. But to reject obedience to God with what you think God is calling you to do, that is rebellion. That's, that's a saying, Christ, you are not my Lord. You are not my master. I'll do what I want. And this is why it is so important to not manipulate and pressure people in areas of interpretive disagreement, okay? Never do a power play. Come impatient and soft because Paul is very clear. Don't pressure someone to see the text your way just because it makes you feel better. He goes on. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to each to teach us so that through the endurance taught in scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And then he gives this little prayer. I love this little prayer. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this little prayer. He prays that they might have endurance. He prays that they might have encouragement. He prays that they might have unity And this prayer makes so much sense to me because if he's saying, hey, church, you can stay together even when you disagree, even when you disagree on important interpretive questions, even when you look at the Bible and you come to different conclusions, you can stay together. If that's his command, well, that's going to take endurance, isn't it? Because that's going to be hard work. That's going to take encouragement from one another that we can do this. And it's going to take a unity that is found in Christ. That's where we find our unity. Not because we all think the same or agree on everything or interpret it all the same. If you're looking for unity that way, good luck to you. But nobody's ever found it yet. You'll be like my buddy. Found a good church yet? No, not a right-thinking church in the whole city. And then he ends his argument with one more point. I love where he lands. He says, listen, if God could accept you, then you can accept each other. If God, who's right about everything, who can accept you, who's wrong about most things, then you can accept each other. Here's what he writes, verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. He says, God gets glory when we love and accept each other, even when we disagree. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it's written, I'll praise you among the Gentiles. I'll sing praises to your name. Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. Again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, that all the peoples extol him. Again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up. One who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. And then he ends in one more prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Leave those words up there for a minute so we can look at them. I'm going to tell you the truth. I sort of wish Paul had ended this section differently. I would find it convenient if Paul had ended this section with something like this. So seriously, we're going to be nice to each other, but there are right answers to all these questions. So if you just ask me all your questions, I'll tell you the right answers. Believe whatever I tell you to believe and we'll all be fine. Wouldn't that be nice if he'd done that? Or maybe if he'd ended it with this prayer, may the God of hope give you all the answers so you're always right. 
Or maybe it ended with this prayer. May the God of peace make sure that we all agree on everything. Wouldn't that have been a great way to end it? But that is not Paul's solution. And you'll be interested to know that never is a solution that Paul suggests to Christian disagreement. All the places Paul talks about Christian disagreement, he never suggests the solution that if we were better Christians, we would just all agree on everything all the time. What is Paul's solution? Trust Jesus. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you get all the answers right. No, that's not what it says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you prove to everybody else why they're wrong and you're right and they should think like you. No, that's not what it says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Jesus. Why would God allow the church to have these disagreements, right? Like, why not just settle all the issues? I wonder if maybe this actually is the reason. So we don't get confused and think that the way you get saved is to get right. And if you just believe all the right things, then you're good with God. And boy, if you believe any wrong things, those people who believe the wrong things, I'm not even sure God loves them. But God's word doesn't leave us that option. Maybe we'll just make this our prayer today. We're going to worship here in a second. If you need prayer, you come forward while we do. Maybe we'll just make this our prayer today. Would you pray with me? God, we find ourselves a people just like this people. We love you. We love your word. We submit our lives to it. And yet we find these moments where we disagree. We read the same word with the same submitted spirit. And yet we come to different conclusions. And maybe sometimes we wish there were a tidier solution, but we're just going to believe your word today that the solution is to trust Christ. So hear our prayer. Would you, God of hope, fill us with all joy and all peace as we trust in Jesus. Oh, that is how we know we will stand, God. The the only way we can be confident to stand before you today, God, is because we trust in Jesus, not because we're right about it all or have it all figured out or obey it all, but because we trust Jesus. So we ask, God, that we might overflow with hope have hope just spilling out of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.